Good morning. morning. We're happy to welcome everyone here to Watkins United Methodist Church on this wonderful day that our Lord has given us. If if you are in person or online and this is your first time, we would like for you to let us know that you're here. And if you have any prayer concerns, please take time to fill out the Connect card on the back of your pew and put it in a tray so we would know and we can pray for you. At this time, would everyone please stand for the call to worship. In worship, we come to shut out the shouting and rushing of our world. As we pray, we search for a different way of being. We honor the word of God to show us the path to follow. In worship, we grow to shut down the hostile priorities of our world. If we will remain standing for our opening here, him, it is well with my soul, verses 1, 3, and 4, page 377, United Methodist Hymnal. Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born under Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sat at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. 
From this he should come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. to greet everyone and pass the peace. Psalm 114 is the scripture for today. When Israel came out of Egypt, Jacob from a people of foreign tongue, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled, the Jordan turned back, the mountains leaped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why is it, sea, that you fled? Why, Jordan, did you turn back? Why, mountains, did you leap like rams, you hills like lambs? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Field. We remember your people who suffered in exile, and Queen Esther who took a stand for such a time as this to end the strife. And still we strive against one another. Our brothers strive against sisters, families strive against themselves. We strive among races, among nations, among classes. We strive across the miles and across the ages. We strive in the Christian family and the human family. But Jesus prayed for our unity. Almighty God, you reconciled us to yourself and gave us the ministry 
of reconciliation. You created one humanity out of the two. You have broken down the dividing wall of hostility. You say there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. You say, how good is it for us to dwell in unity? You say there's plenty of good room. You say, get on board, there's room for many more. You say, lay down your sword and shield down by the riverside and study war no more. And we pray all these things as our teacher and peacekeeper taught his own disciples who still teach us today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to our time of tithes and offerings. As you can see, my favorite QR code is on the screen. But one of the wonderful things that we can do is respond to the graciousness God has given us, the love and the care that he, uh, our God, has given us. And again, I love to, to preach about our youth and children um, as I am their pastor and love to brag on them. <laughs> but your ministry goes to much more than that, that we're able to serve the community through Water Step, like Mark Hogg is going to be preaching about hopefully in two weeks, one week. One week. He'll be preaching with us in one week. But through our giving, we're able to serve in the world, and that is a, a wonderful gift that we can be the uh, hands and feet of God. And so as we come to our time of offering, that you may be gracious and, and respond to the blessings that God has given you. I'd like to now invite the ushers forward.
generous God, you have given us so much in love and joy. Every good thing in our life reflects your caring. Use our offerings, our prayers, and our presences to build a greater kingdom that reflects your light and care for humanity. Help us to hear and live out the teaching of reconciliation today. May we learn to give that to others with wild extravagance. We pray in Christ's wonderful name, who gave his all. Amen. You're now invited to, to sit down and to prepare your hearts for a hymn of preparation. the Watkins, whether it's your first time here or hundredth time here, and hope that you feel at home here in the space. I also especially want to welcome those who join us online, and please let us know that you're with us by commenting there in the box or sharing the video. We are grateful for your presence here in the space. So as Pastor Colin lifted up, we have a special guest preacher next week, and so Mark Hogg, who's the CEO of Waterstep International and former a uh, youth ministry all-star here at the church. I uh, will be here preaching at both the 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock services next week. And so I am super excited to hear him. Last time he preached for us, I was on paternity leave with little Cooper. And so I was here in person. This thing's popping on me. I'm going to unplug it and plug it in real quick, Jeff. How about now? Does that sound better? I like it when technology works, don't you? <laughs> Anyways, I'm excited for him to join us uh, and to, to lead us in, into a discussion. It would be really cool if you cleaned out your closets this week. You found all those shoes you haven't worn in a long time or ones if you haven't worn in the last year, I would say, hey, maybe it's time to look at those shoes. And, and what if we flooded him with a bunch of shoes for water step? And so, or, or perhaps... Uh, you go to a, a shoe store or Goodwill or somebody, uh, some store like that to support their mission and, and just flood them. Can we do that? Let's, let's make that our challenge. Let's flood Mark with some shoes next week uh, as, as we support that great mission that turns shoes into water. Uh, and I'm so looking forward to that. Also, today after our service, or after our 11 o'clock service, we do have a town hall meeting there in the fellowship hall complete uh, with... Uh, a potluck. And so I do encourage you to bring a dish to share and to join with us as I'll present on the lead team model, the one board administrative model, and then we'll take a vote after that presentation and, and Q&A as well. So come with some questions uh, and hopefully I'll come with some answers. I don't know. We'll see you know, as you um, present that. And I think that'll be good for us to be a prayerful people um, between now and then and the many ways in which we can uh, look and see um, how God is guiding us in the near future here at Watkins. With all that in mind, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we are grateful. We are grateful that no matter who we are, what we've done, or where we come from, you call us your beloved child, and that there is nothing we could ever say or ever do to make you love us any more or any less than you do right now. 
And God, as we open up this word, may the same spirit that was here as, the, as we lifted up song to you, as the song was lifted up by our, our beautiful choir today, as we shared in fellowship around uh, coffee and handshakes and fist bumps, God, we ask that that same spirit would be here in the reading of your word, that we may hear something new, that we may hear something fresh that only comes from you, O oh God. That we may not only come to intellectually understand all who you are, as important as that may be, but that we may come to experience you from the inside out. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, Amen. So today we turn to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. I'll read verses 16 through 21. Um, it is about the ministry of reconciliation. So today we continue that, that message series I started last week called Unrelenting Grace where we're diving in of not only what does it mean to be a United Methodist, but what does it mean, I believe, to be a person who follows Jesus so closely? What does that person's life look like? So today we'll talk about connection. So hear these words. So then from this point on, we won't recognize people by human standards. Even though we used to know Christ by human standards, that isn't how we know him now. So then if anyone is in Christ... That person is part of the new creation. The old things have gone away, and look, new things have arrived. All these new things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ by not counting people's sins against them. He has trusted us with this message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors who represent Christ. God is negotiating with you through us. We beg you, as Christ's representatives, be reconciled to God. God caused the one who didn't know sin to be sin for our sake, so that through him we could become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. What do we do with people we disagree with? What do we do with people we disagree with? What? I got a question for you. What do we do with Republicans? <laughs> what do we do with Democrats? What do we do with people who don't care? <laughs> you know, there's an article that came out last year in Pew Research, and the article uh, was a research project of sorts where they interviewed people from all over the country, and they interviewed them asking them several different questions about what they felt like uh, the partisan divide looked like. And what they found, which is no shock to anybody, that there is a growing disparity here, that the, the polls have gotten further and further in our two-party system, and this divide wasn't just differences, but what they found was a rising hostility against the other. Would you agree with this research already? Yeah. Have you experienced this research already? Sure. One of the biggest factors when they were interviewing folks around this was morality, honesty, and openness. Morality, honesty, and openness. And make, maybe there's no surprise to us here, which may be a problem, I believe, is that the growing shares of both Republicans and Democrats say the members of the other party are more this than anything else in the country. So when they asked them questions, and they have, have tracked this for several years, several election cycles and just periods of time in our history of a country, and they asked, you know, kind of this, this span, are Republicans are more blank than other Americans, and, and Democrats are more blank than Americans. And both of these came up way past 50%, around 70%. So if you ask the Republican, what are, can you tell me about Democrats? They would say they are more immoral, dishonest, closed-minded, and unintelligent than the rest of the country. <laughs> and if you ask the same thing, well, at Democrats, what do you think about Republicans? They said and responded in the same way, almost the same percentages. Well, Republicans are immoral, dishonest, closed-minded, and unintelligent. This is at least something both parties got in common as a part of this whole research is their hostility against the other. They both thought that the other party were all of those things, and the numbers are, are close, and all of them are all over 50%, and the average is around the mid-70s percentages. What's significant to that, I, I believe, that I have found, is that these numbers are on the rise every year. They're on the rise every year. 
year. It was fewer than the half of each party six years ago. It was around 20, 30 percent. And now, what did I say the number was more or so around? 70 percent, just six years later. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? See, I think we find this in our own culture, and I would say it's invading our own church, is that we find people on the other side of the aisle of us to be more distrusting, more divided, and more hostile towards those different than us. And all I'm talking about today is political parties, not any other other figure. See, where's the church in all this? Where's the church in all this? What kind of example are we presenting to the rest of the world? See, I would argue in the big C church, not just Watkins, maybe we got it going right here, but not just Watkins, is that we are mimicking the same sort of divides and hostility. And I just can't imagine Jesus being very pleased. You see, there's a story in the Gospels, and the story about gospel and the Gospels, and they talk about Jesus and a person's eyes. So Jesus had just fed the 4,000 people, and they fed 4,000 people by this mere uh, offering of a couple loaves and a couple of fish. It's a pretty amazing miracle. We know that one, right? The feeding of the 5,000 or 4,000, depending on which Gospel passage you look at. And afterwards, the Pharisees, the religious elite, are all up in arms about what this means, and they start arguing with Jesus, and they start trying to trap him and to test him. And so they're arguing and testing, and Jesus in the Gospels just gives out this really great impatient sigh. (laughs) Have you given that impatient sigh before to someone trying to argue with you? And he leaves on a boat immediately with his disciples. He just leaves the argument where it is. But it's on the boat, and the disciples start to, 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 to bicker amongst each other. They're reflecting the same culture they just left from. And they're saying, well, we forgot to bring any of the bread that we just made, right? I mean, we forgot. We don't have any food. We have one loaf to share amongst 12 people, and Jesus just has had it. <laughs> he has had it. I mean, he says, well, didn't you just listen to what I just did? Didn't you just see what I just performed? You are being more like the Pharisee, more like King Herod than anything else. He has this great response. He says, after they're bickering and they're saying, we forgot to bring any food, woe is me. He says this, why are you talking about the fact that you don't have any bread? Don't you grasp what has happened? Don't you understand Are your hearts so resistant to what God is doing? Don't you have eyes? Why can't you see? Don't you have ears? Why can't you hear? Don't you remember? Come on now. I'm just going to use this. I'm going to throw the other one away. I'm not going to throw it away. But I love that response from Jesus. Don't you have ears? Don't you have eyes? I literally just fed 4,000 people with this offering, and you're bickering amongst the 12 of you. And so immediately they get to another part of town, and they get off the boat, and and you know the story. There's a a group of folks gathering around. A crowd is coming because Jesus has just got back on land, and they bring to Jesus a man who is blind. And Jesus heals the man by spitting on his hands, remember the story, and rubbing it on this person's eyes and on his head. And at this point, the man can see once again. It's a beautiful connection of stories. A beautiful connection of stories. Jesus performs first the miracle of the loaves and fishes. He argues with some Pharisees, gets on a boat. Then his disciples start to bicker about not being able to see him. And then he heals a man who was blind. And all of this is connected to that great phrase in the middle of all the stories. Don't you have eyes? Can't you see? You see, he asks that the disciples, not of the blind man, but of those who are given eyes to see. You see, I think Jesus would ask us that same question. I think Jesus would have a good sit down with us and ask the same sort of questions to today. Don't you have ears? Don't you have eyes? Why are you so blind to everything going on around you? There's a great quote by Desmond Tutu that I think has been just a gift for me and I hope a gift for you. Desmond Tutu says this, we are made for goodness. We are made for love. 
We are made for friendliness. We are made for togetherness. We are made for all the beautiful things that you and I know. We are made to tell the world that there are no outsiders. We all belong to this family, this human family, God's family. It's a beautiful quote, right? Why does it speak to us so strongly? That is the question. You see, in our passage in 2 Corinthians, it's probably one we've heard before, the Paul, Paul here, the author of the letter, is not trying to hide that there's any conflict going on. Almost every letter he's writing to is addressing to some sort of conflict amongst church communities. Imagine that, right? That would never happen. But, and they are in conflict with another, and he's not interested in, in merely sweeping the conflict under the rug and ignoring it, but he's also not, not, not interested in kind of uniformity, saying you have to think the same way and you all have to abide by the same things but rather he acknowledges hey there's conflict going on and there's a conflict going on between the old and the new between the old and the new and he highlights that there is a deep tension in their community and in that highlighting he says let me take you up to another level let me take it. And, and leadership culture, there's always that balcony mo- movement, right? Where you can move to the balcony and you can see the ballroom dance going on all underneath you. But sometimes it takes a, a moment for you to kind of have that out of body experience to look at it from above and see everything else that is going on around you. Jesus, through Paul, I believe, does just that. He helps to see the tension, the conflict from the higher level. He says, yes, there, there are actually powers in this world that are battling. And, the, and these powers, we would call them powers and principalities, are seeking to divide us from one aisle to the next aisle. But we find a God who is trying to seek to, to heal those powers and work against those powers of our world to bring about a new kind of world called God's kingdom. And this world is not one of sameness. That would be so boring, right? But unity and love and friendships rather than enemies of new life rather than death. You see, the word reconciliation as a part of our passage means to have a change status. What kind of change status is it? It's a change status from enemy to friend, from old creation to new creation, from an earthly point of view to a godly point of view. It it, it kind of reminds us it's, it's a removal of anything that has separated us from God and other human beings. And it should be obvious to us when we read these passages, but I wonder if the obvious are sometimes too much in front of us that we can't seek to do anything about it. I think what's obvious with us, with the ministry of reconciliation, is that it is impossible to do it if I'm not recon- to be reconciled with God if I'm not reconciled with my sister or my brother. It seems obvious, but it's not. <laughs> I can't be reconciled with someone if I spend my whole life judging them. I can't be reconciled with someone if I I can't see them as God's new creation deep within my own eyes. And I, I can't reconcile with someone if I don't see them as created in the image of God, a person of sacred worth. I can't be reconciled with God. Unless I am reconciled with my sibling. So you might be thinking in part of this. We talked about the partisan divide, but there are so many other things that divide us in this world. And you may think, I, I, I can't see that other person as created the new kind of creation. I can't see that person. All I see in front of me is, is a sinner in need of grace, right? And maybe you're right, and, and maybe you're wrong, to be honest, but... Either way, Paul says, if you are in Christ, you've been given the ministry of what? Reconciliation. We don't get to dismiss people because we don't like them or we're offended by them or we don't approve of them or we don't want to know them or we don't want to go to church with them. God doesn't let us off the hook so easily. I just wish God would. But reconciliation implies that we work through a, an existing conflict. I don't know if you have any conflicts in your life. I sure do. But reconciliation also includes people I don't have relationships with or I may have a prejudice against or I may have a bias. These are people that, that maybe I'm not in open conflict with, but I, I just don't want anything to do with them. And God says we have to tear down those walls too. 
I don't think it necessarily means we need to be best friends with everybody, but we can't be enemies. We can't view them as an enemy. D.J. Riggs says, says this about it, and I think this is how it connects, because I, I, I truly believe that in order for us to be a grace-filled people, I, I, I truly believe in order for us to live into our United Methodist DNA, I truly believe that, that if Paul was here, Paul would say, hey, what is going on with all of this? Can't you see it from my point of view of all that is going on? I think what, what Bishop Carter is arguing throughout this book as well is in order for us to be that healing presence in the world, we have to do things a little bit differently. We have to act and we have to view and we have to see and we have to encourage and we have to empathize because that's who God has called us to be. Deidre says this, she says, as God's ambassadors, we are called to raise the level of discourse and bring healing to those who are hurting and who draw deep lines of division or build tall walls of separation. It's easier said than done, right? As God's ambassadors. Have you, do you view yourself as God's ambassador? Whether you like it or not, you are. <laughs> Whether you take upon that, that, that calling in life, when you decide, hey, you know what, I, I'm going to follow Jesus. I said that prayer, whether you were at a campsite with other youth or children, or whether you went through confirmation in the United Methodist Church, or, or you were saved uh, 16 times through the Baptist Church like I was, right? Yeah, and no matter where you receive that kind of calling in life, God calls you God's ambassadors. And as God's ambassadors, Ms. Deidre says, we are called to raise the level of discourse and to bring healing. See, I wonder, my friends. I wonder if reconciliation is a re-entering in a connection of friendship. I wonder if, if reconciliation for us, it, it means it makes things right, that it works through conflict, and it heals broken relationships. And to be honest, I think that's very odd behavior in our society today. Would you agree? I think it's very odd behavior. I think it looks countercultural to make friendships with people very different than ourselves. I think it looks very countercultural to enter into friendship with those who we may be diametrically opposed to. I mean, as we find that hostility growing higher and higher in our country, and we're recognizing that it goes higher and higher, but we seek to do nothing about it. God calls us back to be faithful, to be ambassadors, to be kind of odd. And it's odd because it's not modeled for us very often. We don't see many examples of it in the world today. It's odd in that it is not normal. There's this great quote about oddness. Now, it's attributed to Flannery O'Connor, but I don't think it's ever, I don't think the author ever wrote it. <laughs> But it's often attributed to Flannery O'Connor. Let's read this out loud. Can we read this out loud together? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you odd. I love that, don't you? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? Odd. Have we lost our oddness? Have we lost what makes us different in this world? If someone followed us around, any one of us throughout the week, this upcoming week, would they notice anything different than the discourse and the division around us? Would they notice that this person's a little off, a little different? You see, my friends, I think it's time for us to rediscover our oddness to come back around to what makes us so different than the other. That despite what our, our voter ID may say about us or anything else that the world seeks to divide us into us versus them, we choose to be together and we work for good in this world. One last story. And Bishop Carter notes of this story in, in his book of the same, of the same name. And he talks about something that we are at an all-time uh, discourse in, in the United Methodist Church. 
As we, uh, I don't know if you knew, the Global Methodist Church had their first annual conference in Lexington, Kentucky, the last three days. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I felt some hostility against my siblings. And I've come to really repent of that, but I'm not done yet. I would call you to the same. But he tells a story, and uh, he says, you know, in the book of discipline, so that, that, that thick, uh, really good, if you need to go to sleep at night, right, that is where you start reading. Uh, I'll quote some of it in our town hall afterwards, and you'll probably fall asleep because you've just eaten delicious food, right? Um, but in the book of discipline, there are two matters that were declared to be incompatible with Christian, Christian teaching. Do you know what those two are? There are two matters that were said, you know, this is incompatible with Christian teaching. And the two things are homosexuality and war. Homosexuality and war. And what Bishop Carter has experienced is that, for the most part, we have not made space for difference regarding sexuality, but we've made a lot of space for war. That we made a lot of space for those who, who serve in the military, and we've made space for those who are conscientious objectors to the whole thing. Now, I remember fresh out of seminary, I was uh, sent to Suntry, Florida. Suntry, Florida is just around the Vieira area, which is uh, Melbourne, Florida, Cocoa Beach area. I'm telling you, it was a hard place to serve Jesus every day. Um, it was two minutes to the beach and the canal, right? I mean, really tough. But the zip code in Suntry, Florida, uh, the city and the appointment in which I, I, I served, at that point had the highest percentage of retired military in the country. Had the highest percentage of retired military. Jackson Air Force Base was right there. Uh, SpaceX program was there that used to be a big NASA, right, Cape Canaveral. Um, so I, I would always joke that in, inside of my uh, congregation I preached to every week and taught in, there was retired generals and rocket scientists in the pews, right, uh, which makes some intimidating things to talk about things you don't really know much about, right. But I remember in that, that first appointment had taught me a lot. One, I, I, I knew a whole lot of nothing. I learned that straight, even at a place called Duke, right? I, I learned I didn't know a lot. But within that congregation, there were very adamant, conscientious exam, uh, objectors. They were very vocal on the evil of war. They were very vocal on their opinions of the military. But sitting right next to them were, were faithful people who, who served within the military for whatever reason. There's people who honored and, 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 and lifted them up. I mean, when, when you came in, there was a, a, a 50 foot, that would not be exaggerating, American flag draped over the back wall. I mean, it's a bit much for, even for me. But what I loved is those two polars, those two folks who, who really didn't, um, they didn't want to talk about war at all. They didn't want to talk about military with each other because they knew they were just so diametrically opposed. They were always in worship together. They always came to the same communion table together. They served together. We had this beautiful community garden that, that some church members wanted to birth, and, and it fed lots and lots of people experiencing homelessness in the area. They did that together. That was really cool. They served the, the homelessness on the uh, homeless, those experiencing homelessness on the streets in Melbourne almost every Friday. Did they have drastic opinions and experiences when it came to the war and military? <laughs> Absolutely. But did that stop them from being with each other in love? See, what would that look like modeled in our world today? What would that look like if that is the thing that made us odd? What kind of gift can a place called Watkins United Methodist Church give to Louisville and to the world? And I think the United Methodist Church as a denomination. People of differing opinions, sure. But they all seek to love Jesus, to follow Jesus, and to put more good into the world. Do you think we could do that together? I sure hope so. Will you pray with me?
To God, we thank you. We thank you that you, you birthed a, a place here in the 60s just right down the road. And you put upon a, a call on, on a people's hearts and a place of uh, fields upon fields of, of like a, a one-lane road that stopped. And, and, and uh, you put upon their hearts to do something wild and crazy of forming a church. And God, that church was never meant to be just a church of Democrats. That church was not formed just to be a, a church of Republicans. That church was, it was not formed to say who's in and who's out, but they had this wild audacity to say, even at that time, hey, there's a God who loves you, a church who loves you, and you are welcome here. Help us, O oh God, to be people of truth, and that truth just makes us a little bit odd. Help us to be a people who seeks reconciliation, who seeks friendships over enemies, who, who seeks love over hatred, or who seeks the, a, a common, big, open table, because God, well, that life is just better that way. Is it complicated? Sure. Is it faithful? Yes. To breathe life into this place, into these people, into these bones, into this building. That every ministry and mission, there may be that same evangelical push. To share and to love. To serve. And to be a people of a deep gladness because of who we are, because of whose we are. May we recover our oddness, O oh God, for the power of the gospel. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, amen. I ask now that you'll stand and you'll stand and you'll, you'll sing out loud, Jesus united by thy grace. We'll sing verses one through three. So may we stand and sing. to live out holy friendship here in the space. We do have Wednesday nights and Wednesday morning activities going on. Um, even this Wednesday, as you, some of you know, where my classes, I'll be out in, in the beautiful uh, campus of Duke University on their National Alumni Council. So that's where I'll be for the next couple of days this week. And, and so, but we do have wonderful people filling in um, to teach and to lead those studies. So we do invite you to come back on Wednesday nights. And of course, we have Mark Hogg coming and preach next Sunday. Uh, we have lots of different things going on this fall. And I encourage you to subscribe to our emails if you haven't done so already. Follow us on social media. We're also doing a, a night at Racing Louisville, the soccer match. And so if you'd like to join us for some women's soccer, that's going to be a great time. There's a a physical sign-up sheet out there, and so you can sign up if you like that. We're also unloading pumpkins at the end of this month, and we need people to sign up to sell those pumpkins. Um, and, and I don't think a, a sign-up sheet, I don't see one out there yet, but I promise there'll be one next week. Or you can contact Cindy in the office, and she'll be sure to sign up. And please do come back um, for our potluck and, and discussion and town hall church conference meeting on the one board model. I've received this benediction. Now go in the name and the power of Jesus Christ as not only a redeemed people of grace, but a reconciled people of grace. To be the odd person 
the person next to you needs you to be. One of love, one of grace, one of mercy, that people may know there is a God who loves them and a church of misfits who loves them just as much. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace, my friends. Thank you.